Hey everybody and welcome back. It's another edition of What Is For Dinner. I'm sorry, What's For Dinner, not What Is. <laughs> I gotta get my, my title straight. So hey, I hope you're all doing well. What do we got going on tonight, hon? So I got off work early today, so I went and bought four ribeyes. Mm -hmm. So you just grilled those on the charcoal grill. I did charcoal and then I loaded mine up with um, some Jane's Crazy mixed up salt and some real butter. Yeah. Not margarine, not fake butter, not I can't believe it's not butter, it's butter. Oh my gosh. Hey, we just learned you could get this at Publix. So, oh, Florida Southeast people. in Florida, yeah. yeah, you can get this at Publix. Nice, good stuff. And then I made bacon, of course. Okay, we did that in the air fryer, so yum. And then, and then I made Alfredo and I picked up some shrimp. I just do the cooked shrimp, so it's already cooked. I yeah. just warm it. But I put tomatoes in there, I put a block of cream cheese, a stick of butter, some garlic, and some Parmesan cheese, and then the shrimp. Nice. Wow, looks good, it smells good. Can't yeah. wait to eat. So will any of this cause your blood sugar and your insulin to rise? Oh, you're just going right for the question. Yeah, I'm going right for it. We're not playing around tonight. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna eat. Yeah, no, so. it will not. So fat and protein do not spike your sugar, unless you're a type one diabetic. Sometimes you have a little harder time with protein, but um, none of this will spike your sugar. Remember, by the time you get an abnormal lab, so by the time you get an abnormal hemoglobin A1C to diagnose you as diabetic, you've been sick for 10 or 15 years. So um, hemoglobin it's a late A1C. marker. And hemoglobin A1C. So diabetes is a late marker. What was hemoglobin A1C it's again? It's the test that corporate medicine uses to diagnose you with diabetes. But there are lots of other tests that can tell you you're creeping toward insulin resistance and diabetes before that. It's just so hard to stay on track with a provider because they leave, they retire, your insurance um, switches, and then people get lost in the shuffle. So you're not even getting these tests every year like you should be. Yeah. So. And what, what I was trying to get at with the hemoglobin A1C is the 90-day average of your blood sugar. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So just to, so everybody knows what it is, what it's, what it's measuring. Yeah. Um, but if yeah. you eat carnivore, it could be a little erroneously elevated because your red blood cells have a longer lifespan than 90 days. So it looks like you could have more sugar on there so anyway yeah so remember though when you're trying to eat like this if you just try to quit cold turkey the sugar and food addiction it's going to be very difficult <clears throat> you will think you don't have willpower that was me no willpower no discipline but really if you cut out carbohydrates and you're not filling it with animal foods or animal protein and fat you're going to be hungry and hunger is a survival instinct and it will always win yeah yeah, you can't go around hungry because you're just gonna, and that's where a lot of diets yes, fail. Yes. Or we're not dieting here. We're doing this is a, a lifestyle change, a way of eating. Yeah. So we don't like to say diet. We like to say we're we're changing our lifestyle. We're changing our way of eating because it needs to be sustainable and long term. Yep. If you're hungry all the time, it cannot be long term. It will not. The hunger will always win in the in the end. That's why people will say, "Oh, I do three days really good, and then I fall off." because hunger wins. Right, right. So the good thing about it is with this way of eating, number one, you can actually eat more food. Yes. You can take in more calories and these calories don't impact you, your, your, your insulin and they don't drive fat storage the way that a high carbohydrate diet does, yep. or way of eating does. So um, that's kind of an advantage. The other thing is, is the higher protein, higher fat content also is more satiating. So you feel fuller and you feel fuller longer. Yeah. So you eat a big meal. I mean, think about it. When you sit down and eat a steak, you're full, like you, you just hit this point where you're just like, okay, I can't put anything else in my stomach. Yes. You know, and you stay like that for quite some time. For me, like I know when I sit down and I eat a big bowl of pasta or something like that, well, first of all, I just don't eat one bowl. Right. I'll eat two or three, I'm not kidding about that. And no. then in an hour later, I'm hungry again. Yeah. It just doesn't have the same, um, the same mechanisms that, uh, that drive the satiety. Well, a thousand calories of like steak and shrimp and bacon and eggs is gonna be way different than a thousand calories of like a Milky Way and a Coca-Cola and a Dr. Pepper or something like that. Yeah. Those hundred calories or thousand calories are going to spike your sugar to no man's land. This hundred calories or thousand calories is going to do nothing. Yeah. So when we're talking about the way of eating and stuff like that, I always like to say like, if you're not, if, if you're talking to somebody about a way of eating changing and you're trying to lose fat, if, if they're not talking about hunger and satiety and the other one we haven't talked about at great length yet is food addiction. Yeah. If they're not addressing food addiction, then I, I feel like that's a that's a failure, you yeah. know, because those are all things that have to be taken into account. It's more than just calories in, calories out. It's more than just fasting. It's more than just, you know, um, all, all those things. Yeah. You've got to you've got to take all this into account. Yeah. But um, food addiction is a huge deal. And remember, um, like 
sugar, for instance, is more highly addictive than alcohol and cocaine, yeah. right? They've done rat studies and the rats prefer sugar over alcohol and cocaine. So just keep that in mind when you're talking about the power of, um, of being able to overcome these foods that you're using or these food-like products that you're used to eating. Yeah. And it's not your fault. The advertising and marketing is targeting you. They're creating hyper palatable foods that just have the right combination. Armies of food scientists with billions of millions of dollars in budget, maybe billions, um, are, are creating these foods that are so palatable that you literally can't resist them. They fire off these different parts of your brain when you eat them and your brain loves it and it wants more. The dopamine receptors are like, oh my gosh, I gotta have more of that. So keep that in mind. Yep. And, and you can't just, yeah, and you also, you gotta be really careful around the food addiction thing too, because a lot of times you go down that rabbit hole of, oh, I'm just gonna have a little of something. I'm just gonna have a little bit of sugar. I'm gonna have a little bit of my banana, a little bit of my oatmeal or whatever. Well, if you're an alcohol and Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, there isn't anybody in there telling you, well, you can just have a little bit of your beer yeah. or a little bit of your booze. You know, that's, that's not what we do. I mean, if you're addicted to something, you have to cut it out altogether. Yeah. And that sucks. It's not easy. No. The hardest part's getting started. We've yes. talked about that before, but it is what it is, guys. Yeah. Did I talk too much? No. Okay. It's good. Sorry. I thought I was like stealing your thunder. <laughs> I don't have much thunder, so. That's uh, all right. You've had a long day today at work. So, um, anything else? No, nope. I think that's good. All right, guys. So, let us know what you're having for dinner. And if you guys have any questions or whatever, we're here for you. And we love you all. And God bless. And we'll see you next time. Yep. Bye. All right. Bye bye, everybody.